we are going to be discussing neoliberalism and sexism. This essentially just outlines what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so I'm just going to start with the context, which is that we all know that South Africa's economy is distorted. And that is in terms of infrastructure, it's in terms of women's position in the economy. And I think perhaps one of the biggest issues that we have right now is that when we talk about the impact of upper state, even within the university context, we tend to gloss over those issues and say, well, there was upper state, but also let's talk economics. And that has essentially put us in a position where we are still trying to get more women into the mainstream economy. Uh, it puts us in a position where when we talk about women and the economy, it's essentially from the context of neoliberalism. Um, so some of the issues that I'm going to be looking at, some of the issues that I'm going to be looking at are in terms of employment. As you can see from this graph, uh, when you look at African women and men, you find that fewer of them are actually in the formal economy especially black women, that is about 21%, which tells, us, which tells us that even though we're 24 years into democracy, we're essentially still in a position where black women are still marginalized, we're still in a position where there's no space that's been created for black women within the economy. In fact, uh, more black women are likely to be in the informal economy than anywhere else. And for me, that, that, that uh, intersects with issues of neoliberalism, where we've gotten to a point where we've said, let's talk about free, tra free trade, let's talk about deregulation and privatization, but we haven't really looked at the impact of those policy ideals. So for example, if we're going to be talking about deregulation, I don't think we've looked at how the repeal of Glass-Steagall, for instance, has impacted, impacted the global economy. So whereas before you had investment banks and commercial banks separated in the states, that bringing them together, as Joseph Stiglitz says, what it has done is to essentially put commercial banks in a position where they're now in the same playing field as investment banks and they're now chasing profits they're becoming riskier, and we can see that in the global financial crisis. So in terms of the impo improvements that we need to be looking at, uh, that speaks for me to not only issues of trying to get more women into formal work, but I think we need to start looking more into issues of the gender pay gap, for example. And I say that because currently, when you look at where women are located within the economy, women are more likely to be in the service industries, which, as we know, pay less than other industries within the economy. And that puts women in a place where they're always going to be earning less. And when I talk about the gender pay gap, I also like to think of it in terms of the peer example that I use. So, for instance, in South Africa now, studies show that women essentially earn 70% of what men earn, right? So, if you look at it in terms of queer communities, for example, if you've got two women who are living with each other, those women are already each earning about 30% less than men. So, what does that tell us? It tells us that children who grow up in households with uh, two women... Uh, what's that? Okay, so while Vasani fixes that, what I was trying to say is that if you look at it in terms of, let's say, a man ends one rank a month, 
you know that a woman's going to earn 70 cents. So if there's two men living together, the total income of that household, if we don't account for deductions, that's going to be two rand. But if you look at the women, that's going to be about one rand forty. Now, how does it impact the children who actually grow up in those families in terms of opportunities, in terms of access to resources? And I think that is part of the conversation that we have not really looked at at the moment. Okay, we are back on. Thank you. So, moving on from the conversation about queer families, and I'm not moving on forever, I'm just saying for now. Um, so when, also when it comes to issues of getting more women into the mainstream economy, I actually attended a course on the green economy and we were discussing how we can use the green economy as a way of integrating women into that. So whereas now the structure of the economy has essentially disadvantaged women to a point where I don't know how long it will take to catch up. The idea was that we could then use the green economy as a way to put men and women at the same starting point. And while I was at this presentation, someone saw there were site visits and went to a plant where they were, I think they were doing waste management and if you look at the plant, it's just men outside doing the work. And when somebody asks, but why are there no women working outside there? One of the managers responded with, well, we don't want lawsuits because you put women with men and things might go wrong. Already, we are creating problems with something that we have said, well, maybe this is an this is an opportunity to fix the problems that exist right now. So when, when we speak of creating new spaces and so when we speak of integrating women into the economy, I don't think we account for how the lack of legislative guidelines essentially allows businesses to continue leaving women behind for fear of lawsuits, for fear of whatever else they they might view as a problem. In terms of business ownership, again, when you look at the numbers, you find that more African women are likely to be in the informal or self-employed areas. And I, I, I know that to be true because both my mother and my grandmother were trading in the informal economy. And the problem with that is not only that there's no protections, but also that there's not enough money to be made. So we continue to perpetuate the same problems that exist. It was a few weeks, ago, a few months ago, actually, in, inside the Pretoria CBD, there's, so there's women who sell amaguinha and, and all that stuff in the morning on the side of the road. And Metro Cops were saying to them, well, you have to pay us or we're going to take your products and vend them. That is a problem. I don't know if it speaks to our, our just, just our general lack of understanding in terms of including everyone in the economy or if it speaks to the bigger issue of corruption within the country. It's a problem. Uh, I'm not sure if I have solutions right now, but I think it's, it's something that's worth looking into. But also, besides that, when you look at the policies that the government has in place, right now we speak of, black in, of the Black Industrialist Program, but how many of the people that have been funded through that program are actually black women? And when I say black women right now, I mean phenotypic, phenotypically black women. I don't know if there is enough. I doubt it. Um, that's the one thing. If you look at the work that the Department of Small Business is doing, I think there was a wave of, let's do cooperatives. And it's essentially the same, for, for me it's the same discussion as the telling of black women that, well, go start to stock fill, go do something else. It does not do anything in terms of solving the problems that exist. If you look at the research in terms of cooperatives, there are 
more likely to fail than they are to succeed. And what we do when we tell women to start cooperatives, we don't account for the fact that they might need money now. So we've said, okay, fine, go start a cooperative. It's going to be easy to work through. It's going to be easy for you to start it and do the work. But how, how do you then account for the fact that the women who apply for the stock well for the for sorry for the cooperatives when they do it they do it with the expectation of being able to feed their families today not in six months time when the program starts to work and i think for me that is one of the biggest failures of government policy when it comes to integrating women in the mainstream economy i was when i was outside i saw a lady walk past and it reminded me of a question that I had, I had once asked at a Women's Month event. When we talk about bringing women into the mainstream economy and we have these things, the people we invite are actually ourselves. We have jobs, we have businesses, but I don't know if any of the women here actually do not have employment. And how then do we start to address the issue of getting those women into the, into the mainstream economy. If we don't even include them in the conversations that we are having right now, essentially what we are doing right now is the thing that the government likes to do where the community is complaining about service delivery, they go build a library instead of asking people what they need. Sometimes they need a clinic. I'm not justifying people banning the, the, the services, the things that they get, the infrastructure, but when people say we need a clinic and you build them a library, that is a problem. It does not address the problems that people in communities face. And it is my view that the way that we are dealing with things now is essentially the same way that government has been doing it for a while. So again, when you look at the incomes, you see the disparities. My white men essentially have it nice. I can't see that far. <laughs> so once again, the issue of incomes brings me back to the gender pay gap. When you look at the research, when you look at your, li your own lived experiences, women are more likely to use the money that they earn to assist the household. And how do we do that when the money we earn is already not enough. I think that's, that's one of the things that we need to start looking at when we have this discussion. And for women who earn, well, women essentially earn less than men. And when you look at the numbers, education for black women does not really come into play as well. You might be educated, but when you get into the job market, chances are you will earn less than some of your colleagues, whether made. That does not always happen, but in some cases, it happens. I believe I have accounted for these. And then in terms of residents, I think given that you know the structural inequalities of South Africa, you would know that black men and black women were essentially in the former homelands. So those were, that is where they were located, and that's where some of them are still located. Uh, just as I end, I think these are some of the questions that we need to start asking ourselves. What does an inclusive industrial policy look like? How do we get women to come into the economy without doing it in a way that says, go start a stock fill, go open a cooperative? We need more tangible things that will allow women to earn the amount of money they need to have a sustainable life, not just something where money comes in today, but we don't know if that money is going to be there tomorrow. And how do we start thinking through those ideas? We have a department of women, but what is that, depa what is that department doing? Is there an opportunity to use that state organ to actually advance women's issues? Thank you.
Next is going to be speaking about macro, macroeconomic policy and things. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's, it's really very exciting to be here as part of this uh, stream on feminist economics. I think it's great that you're doing this as a, as a full stream over these two days. Uh, so the question of the panel is, is neoliberalism the new sexism? And I'm going to say no. I'm going to say neoliberalism uses the old sexism to create a new sexism, which is a slightly different thing. Okay, and um, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of us feminist economists, we spend uh, our energies looking at how particular economic processes affect men and women differentially. Okay, we're looking at the gender impact of policies, processes, and and so on. And that, of course, is necessary. But I think we give up a bit of our argument because we don't look at it the other way. We don't look at how sexism helps particular economic processes and policies. And we really do need to focus on that because it just sort of tears away the lie of a lot of how economic growth is generated and what accumulation processes are based on. So in a sense, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that there are many aspects of the gender construction of societies that capitalism uses. Okay? Capitalism is a bit like an octopus. It just grabs hold of whatever it can and absorbs it and, and shapes it to its own. And when it does that, it actually uh, reinforces particular patterns or alters them in specific ways to its own purpose. And I think it does that particularly with respect to social differentiation, okay? race, and gender are among the big ones. Here in India, it would be caste and gender that uh, you know, make those big differences. So basically, I'm, I'm going to argue that capitalist accumulation, particularly in the neoliberal world, has been hugely dependent on gender differences and the social construction of gender differences, which is why it also varies across countries, because you know, the gender construction is slightly different in South Africa from what it is in, let us say, the MENA region in Middle East and North Africa, or in India, or in Canada, or whatever. So we are going to get different patterns <coughs> emerging. But nonetheless, it uses these social divisions. And it uses them in particular ways. I'm going to highlight three areas where I think it actually has a huge, huge impact. And the first is something which was already touched on in the earlier presentation. It, it's the critical role of unpaid labor. Uh, which, of course, is there. It exists in every society, but the extent of it, the amount of it, and the distribution of it varies a lot across societies. Typically, you find unpaid labor increases as societies get poorer, or the other way around, as societies get richer, there's less unpaid labor. In fact, a lot of what we call services today is stuff that has moved from unpaid to paid. There was a wonderful study by Marjorie Griffith Jones uh, about a decade ago for Canada where she saw, showed that something like 40% of the increase in the service sector over a particular period, I can't remember now, uh, was entirely women who were previously doing various tasks within the home, being working outside and being able to shift a lot of those activities, outsource them into paid work. So whether it is you know cleaning, catering, a whole range of activities, get outsourced and then become part of the GDP and become part of services. As long as they're done in unpaid form within the household, they don't actually do this. But typically, the unpaid labor is of um, two forms. One is the straightforward care economy. You know, it's the looking after people. The old, the sick, the young, the healthy adults who still think they need care, you know, of different kinds, emotional and other care, you know, and on housework-related activities, this, the, the direct care. What, what is typically known as social reproduction. That's a very large element. But in a large number of developing countries, including South Africa, including India, including a bunch of other African countries, there's a whole lot of what you could call related activities, which are essential for household survival, and which are not cared specifically, but are, very, are typically seen as women's work. Fetching water. In, in India, fetching fuel wood is a big one. I don't know how important that is here looking after you know, family livestock, poultry raising, kitchen gardening, 
you know, uh, tailoring and sewing for the home, tuition of small children or even grown children and so on. These are all activities that are actually economic activities, even recognized uh, as economic activities, unlike the care economy, but which are often performed in unpaid uh, ways within the household because families can't afford it. And of course, when they're performed unpaid, then those women are not seen as in the workforce. In India, they're not even looked at as defined in the workforce. They are defined as not in the labor force. Uh, and that means that you reduce the number of workers. If, uh, when you're looking at, let's say, aggregate productivity, you're looking at GDP divided by the number of workers. You're not including all of these unpaid workers. It's a huge subsidy of unpaid work to the formal economy, to the recognized economy, which is unrecognized. It's unrecognized by policymakers. It's unrecognized by those who are looking at long-term changes in income, productivity, blah, blah, blah. It's unrecognized uh, in all kinds of important ways, which means that policymakers also don't give importance to these as huge priorities. You know, the provision of drink, uh, you know, piped water to every household, let's say, piped fuel to every household, uh, affordable, not just pipe, but affordable, these are not seen as policy priorities because it's all being subsidized. It's being done for free by women who have less political voice in any case. In India, uh, for example, we have a very low women's workforce participation rate, and it fell even more in our period of high growth. It fell from 36% to 24%, which is abysmal, right? Most of that is in rural areas, and most of that was in the bottom half of the rural population. And it turns out it was all increases in these activities. In, in the Indian statistical system, it's called Code 93, you know, when women do household work plus all this other stuff. And it was an increase in Code 93 that accounts for the decline in women in paid employment. Partly because, you know, you can't do without the water, you can't do without the fuel, somebody has to collect it. The women who are collecting it cannot make themselves available for other economic activities. So there's this, there's this uh, peculiar way in which there's a massive subsidy to the formal sector that is completely unrecognized by the general population as well as by the policy makers, which in turn has massive policy implications. <coughs> the second way in which gender matters is that this generates a kind of paid to un unpaid continuum. You know, women are all along, there's no, nobody is not working, if you see what I mean. When you're looking at work participation rates, especially if you look at work as defined by the ILO, every woman is working, right? They're just not recognized as working. So there is a paid to unpaid continuum. Now, the meaning of that continuum is actually pretty bad for women, okay? In other words, what, it, what does it do? It does two important things straight away. One is that other work that women do is not valued by society because so much of what they do is done for free anyway. So when women work, they t their work tends to be less valued by society, which in turn means they're given lower remuneration. A large part of the gender wage gap thing results from that. But the second is that then women, when they do work, the activities that they do, are concentrated in become low wage activities. And it's peculiar because where the, you find that, there are lo that, that certain occupations are dominated by women, it turns out that even the men working in those activities get lower wages. Yes. Huh? In other words, the wage penalty exists for the men and the women in those activities. Nursing is a classic example, but there are a whole bunch of other activities which are dominated by women. So in fact, the paid and paid <coughs> continuum does this. Now the paid and paid continuum has huge implications we find in India it's not just the private employers. Of course, private employers are baddies, and we know it. You know, and, and they're sexist, and they do bad stuff. But our government employs women as underpaid voluntary workers. They're called voluntary for a reason. It means you don't have to pay them the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Our health system, our early child protection system, our maternal uh, protection system rely on these underpaid workers. They are not called formal government employees. They are called volunteers, and they're paid an honorarium. And this honorarium ranges from one-tenth to one-quarter of the minimum wage, because they're supposed to be doing part-time work out of a sense of 
benevolence to the community because we're all earth mothers, right? We love yes. helping people. And <laughs> it's just we like to do all this stuff for free. So we, we are part of communities and so on. And this has enabled governments to provide public services on the cheap. Now, why is this part of neoliberalism? Because neoliberalism does, wants you to reduce public service spending massively, right? Fiscal consolidation is the name of the game. You do not spend on public services. Well, how's one way you reduce that spending? By paying wages as low as possible. How do you pay such low wages? By using existing social constructs like gender. And the fact that both men and women undervalue women's work. The women themselves, the ones working, also undervalue that work. Precisely because of the paid unpaid continuum. So that leads me to my third big implication of this gender construction, which has macroeconomic dimensions, which is segmented labor markets. I think already mentioned, yeah, these, and it's absolutely true. Labor markets are segmented by race, by education, by gender, many different things, but gender is a very, very big one. And we find across the world, but particularly in some of our countries, there's a very strong occupational segmentation. There's a concentration of women in certain sectors and in those sectors in certain activities. Okay? You go to any garment industry anywhere in Asia, all the workers will be women, all the supervisors, managers, and office people will be men. Okay? Uh, you, I mean, across the board, you will find other activities, but there's massive, massive occupational segmentation. And what is remarkable is that this occupational segmentation in the countries that I have studied has increased rather than decreased in the neoliberal period. If we take the neoliberal period, supposing you take data from the mid-80s as sort of, you know, beginning of neoliberal, but not yet neoliberal, and you take data from the mid-2000s, you find strong increase in occupational segmentation. And another aspect of that is that women are increasingly rationed out of the good jobs. Where there are good jobs, jobs that are desirable, you know, regular government jobs, jobs in organized manufacturing, jobs in, in you know, the better off services that provide higher remuneration, disproportionately women get excluded from them, okay? despite having similar levels of education and so on and so forth. So that's another angle to the occupational distribution. How does that in turn help neoliberalism? Because it enables you at each level of economic activity to keep pressure on wages, kind of, on constraining wages to, to keep it going. In other words, it's not just the aggregate wage bill you can reduce, you can reduce it pretty much along the line using this occupational distribution. Which is why when we look at aggregate win gender wage gaps, they tend to be huge. I think we saw the data already for South Africa. In India, it's similar. Our average female to male wage is about 66%. But it has fallen. Uh, it fell to 62% in the, recent, the most recent data we have over the neoliberal period. How do you get that? Precisely because of this ability of the accumulation process to rely on the occupational wage gap, the paid to unpaid work continuum that women are engaged in, and the recognition of um, labor markets in general, that it's, it's much harder to find a job anyway to take what you can get, if you like. Mm -hmm. Which is, if you like, the big strong message of neoliberalism. If there's one message in terms of the labor market, it's that one. You're lucky for whatever you have, if it isn't going to be a worker in China taking it, it'll be a robot. So just behave yourself. You know, don't mess around too much. Or to say, well, a woman might come and take it, and then won't you be angry? You know, so either way, there's a kind of uh, use of these. Finally, um, no, not finally, sorry. How much time do I have? Lots. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Not, not that much. Okay, two more slides. Yeah. What's another area in which these gender patterns affect the macroeconomic patterns. Migration. I'm not, I have to confess, I'm not very uh, in touch with the migration patterns from South Africa. So what I'm saying has much to do with Asian migration patterns. But as you know, one of the recent interesting features, in, when I say recent, last 30 years, I'm very old, so I think recent, you know, <laughs> long time. Um, <laughs>
last 30 years, what have you found? You found that there are many more women migrating for work on their own. Okay? Historically, this was not a pattern. Women would migrate with men as part of family migration or after the men had migrated and so on. You find an increase in women migrating on their own. Salima here has done a lot of interesting work on nurses' migration. But there is a lot of, there's an increase in this, a significant increase in this, especially in a number of countries in Asia. Now, where in fact this women's migration has gone up hugely, and three clear examples are the Philippines, uh, Sri Lanka, and the Indian state of Kerala, where there's a lot of women's migration. You find there's a very interesting pattern in remittances. And this is something that you know people didn't got on, on to, although it should have been obvious until it was very late, which is to say that when women migrate, the pattern of remittances changes quite sharply. Okay? Men's migration, the remittances tend to be very pro-cyclical with the host country, which is to say when there's a downswing in the host country, then the men send less remittances home, either because they lose their jobs or because they have lower wages or for whatever reason. Whereas you do not find that pattern with more women migrants. And why is that? It's because the men migration tends to be dominantly in manufacturing and construction and to a lesser extent in services, but mostly in you know, um, hospitality services, hotels and, and stuff like that. Women's migration tends to be dominantly in care work, nursing, okay, and then domestic work, at least from the, these three locations that I've mentioned, Philippines, Sri Lanka, and, and Kerala, dominantly it's in these three service activities, which are all care economy related. Now, these are largely impervious to the business cycle in the host country. They don't really change very much. Two, fe two features of women's remittances, first of all, they send a higher proportion of their income back home. Okay? And secondly, when they uh, do, I mean, they, it tends to be much more resistant to economic movements in the host country, and much more strongly associated with negative economic movements in the sending country. So if you know your family is having a hard time, you send more than you were sending earlier. Okay, even though you're having a hard time yourself. These are patterns that have been found, but it's, it's not just, if you like, the psychological behavior of women, it is the fact that they are in sectors that are less affected. Now, this led to results that the IMF and the World Bank found really surprising, but which would have been obvious to anybody who <laughs> looked at, you know, who thought of it in gender differentiated terms, which is that after the global crisis and when there was a big, you know, a strong impact on migration, Remittances to Mexico, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Egypt, etc., collapsed. Okay? Really fell dramatically, very, very sharply. Remittances to Philippines, Sri Lanka, and India didn't fall. In fact, they increased. Okay? And this is really to do with the gender component that I've been talking about. And you can explain it completely once you realize that these are countries dominated by women's <coughs> migration. In Sri Lanka, the ratio is 13 women to one man migrant. In Sri Lanka, the ratio is eight to one. Okay, so you can explain it. Okay, and um, finally, uh, and of course, the other countries were dominantly male migration, so that's why you get that different impact. Okay, finally, on the conditions of self-employment. You know, just like women are used to working all the time, they're also used to working all the time when they do self-employment. Right? And it's also true that women dominate in self-employment, but it is also true that self-employment in some shape or form has become the defining type of work under neoliberalism, mm -hmm. even in countries where it did not exist. What has that meant? It has meant that the kinds of lack of protection, uh, you know, taking on of all the risks of production, etc., taking on all the hazards of the work, which were an, a sort of regular part of women's work, whether paid or unpaid, have now become features of self-employment as well, male self-employment as well. In other words, women's work has become the prototype for all work under neoliberalism. So what has neoliberalism done? It's created a new sexism where everybody gets the same shit. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
relationship between some of the earlier streams that spoke about you know women's daily experiences and how uh, I mean we invited people who are really in in various ways um, struggling um, either as sex workers or as, as small-scale farmers really in uh, speaking about many of the issues that you have also in cap like captured, which, which says something about feminist economics, at least, um, where there isn't like, uh, uh, like such a separation, well, a particular kind of feminist economics, at least, <laughs> that, you are, that you are articulating, so which, 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 does, which draws from experience and, and theorizes from that. Uh, so thank you very much, because this actually gives us a way of how to, in our various spaces, to, to, to both act and also to think while we act. Um, you know, you're at TIPS, and it's amazing that TIPS is also thinking about gendered industrial policy uh, in this way. Uh, I think that's a very exciting thing to have within an economics space. Um, this, and it's not, you know, like to mainstream it across government. I, I think that is very, very important. Um, and uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, thing, uh, claim that you made about, um, which is something that I think uh, some of our Oxfam uh, uh, South Africa um, uh, colleagues would, would want to also engage in uh, as a side when, when, you, when you speak about how seeing um, policies, okay, when you talk about what meaningful participation is, which I think both of you captured, which is uh, to see um, uh, policies such as co-ops as residuals, uh, as where we push women into these spaces rather than others would see as actually emancipatory. So it's, it's quite interesting to have that kind of uh, lens and thinking. Uh, and um, yes, uh, thank you, thank you. I, I don't wanna, I shouldn't, yeah. I think we should take it to the floor. <laughs> any questions, any questions, please? Sorry, just a quick one here. Um, I, please I introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Um, please use, use <laughs> the mic, please. Um, just because uh, it's interesting. Um, we, we live um, in South Africa within what I find is a very troublesome economic orthodoxy around get the FDI in to grow, to create jobs, and that is no longer it seems in the public space up for debate um, as to whether or not that's actually what is going to actually create uh, economic opportunity. I'm just interested to understand the, the sequence in which you spoke of the, um, the high growth period in India and women's participation going from 36% to 24%. To understand the breakdown of that because I think we need to be able to inject some critical analysis as to how this just grow um, orthodoxy is actually problematic, so I'd just like to understand that. Thanks. Okay, can we take two more? Would you find more? Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Janet uh, from Bates University. Um, unfortunately, I missed part of your presentation, but still, I, I think I'm going to just make some elementary and generic. Uh, sort of comments. Uh, I think on the proposals around the proposal around how to integrate the informal economy into the formal. I think I'm actually burned out as a feminist in terms of uh, that particular person. It has been troubled on many uh, troubles. Uh, let me say the conversation has always been ongoing, ongoing, but. It looks like uh, we kind of move forward and backwards, we are ambivalent, and we are not too serious about who exactly uh, should be responsible for doing this, it seems. Um, what, what do I mean? I think, um, yeah, given the <laughs> policies in place, um, and I, I understand for those who understand the debates around the informal economy, we all know the three um, perspectives around the informal economy. So for me, it's like, what's the context of our particular country that we are talking about here? What makes it difficult to um, 
promulgate policies that are pro the informal economy. I'm just saying, I know these are technical questions, it's not something that we can all have answers to. But I'm like, how then do we move forward beyond the debates and conversations that we've been having for almost 20 years now? What should we put on the table uh, as we leave this particular festival? But also, just a comment to um, uh, Shayat. Uh, around the issue of migration. I'm a migration scholar here at Britain Visitor from the African Center for Migration and Society. And actually my PhD thesis was focusing on uh, the issue of um, migrants, cross-border migrants in South Africa. And it's very true. I think there are some similarities um, and parallels that we can draw from India and South Africa. Uh, the feminization of migration indeed has increased, but when we find these women, they find themselves in the vulnerable sectors of the economy. Of course, due to restrictive uh, immigration policies, like for instance, you realize that a teacher from Zimbabwe can't, uh, or a nurse, cannot get a permit, a work permit. Where do they find themselves? They'll be relegated to those particular sectors which are easy to, en to enter, like the informal economy, the domestic work, uh, which also leads us to the issue of job mismatches, and I guess the aspect of remittances, in as far as we might want to um, glorify it, it's not really realistic in the context of the Southern African migration uh, regimes and um, the labor, that market itself. Okay. All right. So uh, anyway, I was just commenting. Uh, perhaps we can chat more about this because I um, exclusively focused on the hospitality sector where more of these migrants actually find them. But you would also have this question around union protection, um, which is very critical. Uh, mobilization issues, how then do we encourage them to participate and perhaps claim their labor rights in South Africa. But let me stop here. Uh, sure, thanks. Thank you. Um, any more questions and please try to, and comments, please try to keep them as succinct as possible. I can say that she's my friend. But... <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you both so much for your presentations. Um, I like the, you know, in, on Facebook, the status where, like, what do you do, self-employed? <laughs> that appears on many of our statuses, right? And you know that the session uh, has a lot to do with policy. I have a question or comment, and I'd like your reflections on uh, whether we are reviewing the Beijing Platform for Action or any other such uh, agreement at a global level, there's been a tendency by feminists, I and mean, this has caused like some tensions when we think including the word gender in a document will address, um, you know, the inclusion and parties. Never mind what the content is. <laughs> Right, whether it, it does not necessarily uh, critique, it's that discussion we're having about how we want to accommodate ourselves in an already miserable situation like neoliberalism. So I'd like your reflections on that. The second one related to this has been, and glad, yeah, I'm glad you're here, has been about our approach in relation to Brits. We have. Uh, we welcomed the group of 22 within the WTO as revolutionaries, as feminists, to say it's disrupting the system. BRICS comes about as a way in which we think that um, developing countries are going to help us, you know, to achieve. And it's been tense. It's been a very tense situation of participate or don't participate. It could help uh, uh, our economies at the local level. We don't have to rely on the IMF and the World Bank. We could develop policies in which we are wonderful with China and Russia, 
and look in the south and so on. So I would like uh, your reflections on that because this is where some of the tensions around even police and participation and as feminists is one of the things that uh, we find ourselves uh, yeah. Okay, so let's have those that round and then second round and that. Oh. <laughs> I have to make myself be brief because these are very big questions, but thanks a lot for these. Yeah, Shinganta, I think, uh, on, you know, trickle-down growth strategy. So first of all, FDI generating growth, no, it didn't. It wasn't FDI. FDI came along for the ride when we were growing, and it also came along to extract our natural resources. That was all the FDI we got. The rest of it was portfolio flows and private equity, which was out there to make a quick buck. Uh, so it wasn't FDI generated. Our growth was the result of a boom because we got discovered by foreign capital otherwise. You see what I mean? You know, we already did our financial liberalization in the mid 90s, but people didn't notice. And then, you know, they're looking around for the next emerging market to conquer, right? And so they found India and they said, oh, yes, India, let's go. So your finance minister gets on the cover of Forbes, somebody else is on <laughs> Business Week, you know, the usual yeah. stuff happens, and you get a lot of portfolio capital inflow, which improves liquidity, which enables domestic asset market booms, which gives you a kind of wealth effect, combined with a lot of tapping into natural resources. You know, the, a lot of the so-called scams of that period were natural resource related. Um, easy access to mineral resources in many states, and spectrum and a whole range of things like that. Why did, and when you understand that this was the nature of the growth, it's almost not surprising that it didn't generate much formal employment. You know? That and that it it added to the existing gender differences and, and so on. And caste differences I might add as well. Why is just grow prob uh, problematic? First of all I think two points here. More FDI doesn't mean more growth, even GDP growth. Second point, even GDP growth, you have to really look at what it contains, what, you know, how much of it is in particular sectors that are essentially bubbles, which turned out to be what was happening in India, mm. and uh, whether it is the kind that generates what Hyman Minsky called bubble up economics, you know, where employment from below generates multiplier effects and is much more sustainable as a growth path. <laughs> So just grow, clearly not uh, an answer, but I would put it even more strongly. At the current moment, despite what our governments tell us, that o option is no longer available to us. FDI is, forget FDI, foreign capital in general has decided that it doesn't want to get in here anymore. It's moving on, or back, if you like, not on, but back to the US and other core countries. There is much more instability in the world where the export-led growth strategy is no longer so available. And therefore, that particular model that kept us going over the 2000s is not there for us to utilize. We can pretend it is, but it isn't there. And policymakers who stick to it are doomed to fail. Because it does, it's not there anymore as an option, I would say. Formalizing, yeah. You know, on, well, Hamida and I are, are actually involved in a project looking at, this, uh, at the gender implications of formalizing. And I think one of the critical things we have to remember about formalizing, there's so many different definitions, right? Everybody can find their own definition of what is formal and formalizing. And in that process, it's very easy to lose sight of why you want to formalize in the first place, which is to improve the conditions of the people who are doing the work, whether they are self-employed or employed workers. So I think when we look at any attempt at formalization, our first question must be, how does this benefit the actual workers or producers? And what is it that in the pattern of formalizing that is going to benefit it in a sustained way? At the moment, we do a lot of stuff, whether it's forcing registrations or it's in, in India, we did a, a, a very stupid GST, goods and services tax that destroyed a lot of small informal sector. We've done uh, um, very coercive attempts at digitization by demonetizing currency. You know, we've done all these measures which have actually destroyed informal activities 
and made the conditions of workers in them much worse. So while the objective is formalizing, and while you might get more so-called formalization with you know, more enterprises registered somewhere or the other, that's not really what we want. You know? So I would say that that would, that would be how we look at this issue. And yes, I completely agree with you. A lot of this women's migration is in very, very vulnerable sectors. There's no disputing that. And domestic work is the most vulnerable of all because you're in a private space with employers and you know, all kinds of harassment and exploitation occur. People's passports are taken away. I mean, all kinds of terrible things happen. I'm not denying any of that. All I'm just saying is that uh, to the extent that countries do glorify remittances, they tend to ignore the gender dimension of the remittances, and they don't even think of the things which would then thereby, I mean, the Philippines has only recently started looking at laws to protect those workers who travel abroad, the women workers. You know, so uh, I think that is a, a realization also that has to be brought into that, that picture. Um, yeah, are we reviewing Beijing Platform for Action? I completely, you know, in fact, a lot of the times what I'm really depressed by is that we have so many wonderful international documents. I mean, you look at CEDAW, right? Yes. It's got everything, you name it. We don't need to fight for anything anymore. Everybody's signed up to CEDAW, it's wonderful, no problem, except that nobody does it. So I, I don't know, I'm, I also have spent time on, you know, trying to make sure international documents are good and in our favor and so on, but I'm increasingly cynical about how effective they are. Because it's very easy to go out there and, you know, say it. It's much more complicated and also much more unlikely for governments to actually come back to their countries and do something very systematic. And I think that only happens with popular pressure. It happens because they're forced to do it, not because they suddenly feel good about it. You know, so I, I would say, yeah, uh, we can't really, you know, be satisfied when we manage to insert something somewhere. You know, unfortunately, yeah. of course, it's worse when they don't insert it. That, that's <laughs> unfortunate. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, then it makes life even worse because then they do things like, you know, cut aid for abortion clinics and you know, all kinds of other bad stuff happens then. On bricks and very quickly. Yeah, you know, BRICS is such a weird outfit, okay? <laughs> an, investment, an investment banker writes an article saying these four countries are the hope of the 21st century because of their demographics. Yeah. This is what Jim O'Neill wrote. Yeah. 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 So then these four countries say, oh, really? And then everybody else starts writing about these four countries and the international financial press gets excited and then all of us get capital inflows. And then we start thinking, oh, yeah, right, we are. And we start meeting and then China says, hey, let's add South Africa. So we have BRICS. <laughs> now, I'm serious. This is the history of the BRICS, OK? Now, ultimately, what is it? Think of it. Think of the positioning. It's a bunch of regional sub-imperialists wanting their seat yes. at the high table. Okay. You know? and, um, now, am I saying that they shouldn't be? No, because anything that opens up is more democratic, right? So sure, it's better than G7. D20 is better than G7. Is G20 better than UN? No. <laughs> But uh, that's what BRICS is. BRICS has then positioned itself, like the New Development Bank, the, you know, the, the, um, the currency transfers, you know, all of those other, the, the currency swap arrangements and various other things, to try and become the kind of lead dogs of their region. You know, I mean, saying, OK, we can carry the rest of our regions with us, and we are now going to be representing the rest of the developing world, and we will try and negotiate things to suit ourselves. The trouble is how do feminists respond to this one, yeah? And I would say that, you know, we cannot afford not to engage with anything, unfortunately, because we can all say, oh, yeah, it's like that, and be snooty about it, but it's going to happen anyway. So you cannot say you will not engage, unfortunately, okay? But we have to engage with a degree of realism that these are not fundamentally progressive in their orientation. You have to push them to be more progressive. They are not fundamentally more inclusive in their orientation. You have to push them. They are not fundamentally interested in other developing countries. You have to push them, okay? And within that, when BRICS, at least the few BRICS meetings that I have been vaguely associated or you know, privy to or something, BRICS is really still very much within the neoliberal economic paradigm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, all of our governments are, so it's no big surprise. Uh, China is very heterodox internally, but it wants everyone to do neoliberal stuff outside because it suits China. Yeah, China will continue to be incredibly heterodox, careful, and smart in its internal policies, but it wants everybody else to be neoliberal. So they are not presenting an alternative economic perspective. So our job is to put that perspective on the table at BRICS, but also at all other platforms, mm. while recognizing that they're not fundamentally different from the other groups. Mm. I think that my... <coughs> oh, yeah, okay. but it's fine. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I think the questions have essentially been covered. I'm not going to repeat uh, what's been said. But I just wanted to speak to Janet's question about how we move beyond just having discussions. Then we like talking. We have conferences, we have nice lunches, and then it stops there. Um, I was actually in a panel discussion this morning, and one of the things that we discussed was we come to university, we go to work, we do different things, but do we actually take all those experiences back to our communities? And perhaps that is where we start. We need to start thinking about going. So it's it's not good enough for Unawanda to have a master's in economics and get a job at TIBS and it ends there. I have to be able to go back into my community and actually start doing something. I'm not saying I'm doing it now, but the discussions that we've been having today have actually put in my mind the fact that we're not really going to change anything if all we ever do is attend these conferences, get our names on the list, and we leave it there. So what we need to do is Basically, let's, let's go back to our communities. The experience that we have, the skills that we have, I think that's a good start for us to actually go back and say, well, these are the things we see, and these are the things we can change with the knowledge that we have. Yes, I think that's what I remember the order. So you are one, you are two, you are three. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm Julian Steyer from uh, CFTV. I'd just like um, uh, Professor Gosh to address um, a couple of issues. Um, uh, you alluded to how capitalism um, uses social categories, but you know here we have um, large debates around the primacy of economics versus other social categories, as in gender and race. So could you reflect on it? Because uh, you know, you don't want uh, these other social categories just to get a perfunctory ma uh, mention. You know, you want, you want to integrate them. But uh, it's, it's a repeated debate and it's quite tiresome. You know, the universal versus the particular. And these are hard to uh, resolve. But how do we not lose the economic space? So I'd like you just to reflect on India uh, on that one, right? The other thing is I'd like you to reflect on uh, this dialectics of reform and radicalism, like you alluded to about BRICS. You know, is there something for the left to take on regarding full spectrum engagement? <laughs> um, uh, and, um, yeah, and just your um, sense of uh, what do you think about uh, rising China means for Africa, just very briefly. Uh, Oh yeah, small questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I have a small question. Um, I just want to hear Professor Gash talk all day, every day. <laughs> but I want to hear more about, um, particularly more about taxation and the sexism in taxation and the neoliberalism. Because we see incredibly increasingly in our countries where we have presence of the IMF, a push towards less taxation for big corporations and introduction of that. So how's that all playing out within the sexism in neoliberalism? Um, you spoke of Kerala, that it's one of the provinces where you're having, you know, people living and migrating somewhere. Uh, from my little um, understanding or conversations with people from India, Kerala has always been sold as the star province in terms of where socialism has actually worked. 
and where um, women uh, participate in government and where equal opportunities are. They are trying to create that with their own model. So it has always been sold as the star child. So in that case, why would you have um, many women uh, moving out of that uh, province to actually go and find work somewhere? I mean, uh, I would imagine that places like Delhi, where capitalism and the city of capitalism within the Indian space, that maybe you've got higher percentages of women moving out looking for work elsewhere. Okay, I'm going to keep sitting, if that's all right. Yeah, okay, I'm going to begin with the, in reverse order, uh, about Kerala. Yeah, you know, it, India is such a complicated place. Uh, Joan Robinson used to say, whatever you can say about India, the reverse is also true. <laughs> it's, it's also true, and it, uh, we're full of contradictions. So is Kerala. Kerala is the most highly educated state. It's had complete literacy for a long time now, and everyone's done primary education and so on. It has the best social indicators, infant mortality on par with Western Europe, but you know, all of that kind of thing. Um, however, it has some very peculiar features of patriarchy. So very high educated proportion of women and very low women's workforce participation. Okay, so they're all educated women who are not working. And in Kerala, it's not because they're collecting drinking water. Sorry. Oh, it doesn't oh, work? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't have to do it again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Kerala is, is um, in a peculiar state because despite very high literacy and education rates of our women, in fact, their work participation is very low, one of the lowest in the country. And it's a peculiar kind of patriarchy where it doesn't reflect in absolute indicators, if you like. You know, I mean, the rest of the country is also killing off baby, young girl babies and, you know, doing real stuff. Huh? Uh, in Canada, no. In Canada, the nutrition and uh, life expectancy and other indicators are around the same uh, of girls and boys, okay? So it's not reflected in that way, but it's reflected in other peculiar forms of misogyny, which persist including in not allowing women to be very free in public places, in preventing you know, work participation, uh, within uh, outside work participation, a lot of that. For some reason, the uh, nursing thing has taken off in a big way, but not so much domestically. Kerala exports nurses. It exports nurses to the rest of India, it exports nurses to the rest of the world. So it's not domestic work in the same way, which is, which is what you would get in other parts of India. So it's nurses in Kerala. And for some reason, nurses, nursing is seen as an acceptable profession outside Kerala. For good, <laughs> not so much inside. Yeah. Um, the sexism, absolutely, the sexism in taxation. Uh, I'm so glad you raised it because often when people talk about you know, gender issues and fiscal policy, they look at expenditure patterns only. But in fact, the pattern, taxation pattern has a very, very strong uh, gender implication. Globally, the shift to regressive taxation is, is huge. And the fact that we are giving up so much revenue in direct taxes, knowingly giving up, because we allow these loopholes that enable both tax evasion and tax avoidance you know, by companies and by high net worth individuals, I've just come from a meeting in New York precisely on this issue of reforming international corporate taxation where it emerges that the amounts that we're talking about are really up to as much as 500 billion a year that we are giving up globally. And in our countries, you know, this is money that could fund everything we wanted and more. Our entire wish list for development uh, could be funded by money that South Africa is giving up, that India is giving up. A lot of it knowingly. It's true, some of it is global, some of it is these bad uh, um, tax havens. The worst tax havens are the UK and the US, okay, because the Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Wight, blah, blah, they're all tax havens. In the US, Delaware, etc., they're all tax havens. And when they want to get up to tax havens, they pick poor old Barbados or Panama or something, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, it's not just that, it is also that we continue our developing countries, not to share information among ourselves, 
not to put in place measures that would at least limit some of that tax avoidance. And for a very long time, tax avoidance has not been seen as a gender issue. Feminists have not taken up tax avoidance as an issue. So we are not even talking about raising tax rates. We're saying implement the bloody laws. Excuse my language. Right? Um, and it's a feminist issue because you do not get the money for the much needed public services or for paying public workers properly or anything until you actually do this. So I'm very happy you raised this point. Yeah, what does rising China mean for Africa? Mm. Good and bad. It, it depends on what you make of it. In fact, I have a PhD student who's just uh, done some work on uh, China and Africa, and she looked at three different countries. And it, the, the, uh, the implications vary hugely depending on your own industrial policies, your own trade policies. So, uh, Tandika, who spoke yesterday, had a very good phrase for it uh, last time when I heard him speak. He said, it's always better to have competing imperialists. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, there's no point saying, oh, China's just behaving like Europe used to behave and so on, because it does change. They are forced to behave. It, Angola is very interesting. Nobody, no foreign aid came for infrastructure, or no, no loans came for infrastructure investment in Angola for a very long time. The Chinese came and gave everything to a very corrupt government. No one's disputing all of that. They gave a lot of infrastructure loans. Suddenly, everybody's queuing up to give infrastructure money to Angola. It changed the way the Western powers do it as well. There's no doubt that the period of rapid uh, export volume increase combined with export price increase that Africa has experienced until you know the last crash was largely driven by Chinese demand. There's no doubt about that. And that meant a lot more to you than any foreign aid and foreign you know, capital investment and all of these things. In terms of the Chinese capital investment, it also depends on how African governments play it. So if, you know, if they come and say, here's a huge infrastructure project, and you say, yes, we just take it, without thinking of it in context, in terms of a plan, in terms of an ecosystem around that infrastructure, in terms of which synergies it will have and where you want it, then it may not be so good, but that will be largely your own fault. So I would say it's an opportunity, you know? Sure, there are issues and concerns, and I, I mean, I've heard these concerns over and over again in Africa, I, but there are concerns, but it's also an opportunity, and it a lot depends on how you play it, I would say. Yeah. Um, reform versus radicalism. No. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you, you had an even more terrifying phrase after that. I <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, let me put it this way. See, I'm really old. I am not going to wait for the revolution. Okay? <laughs> uh, so, I say, do whatever you can, when you can, where you can. Yeah? And I'm not even particularly choosy about it now. Even if it's a really tiny, tiny little thing that doesn't seem to make much difference, if it can make some difference, yes, go for it. Okay, so I am now completely, uh, maybe it's a bad thing, but I'm completely unprincipled and unideological about where you can intervene and how you can intervene. I say, wherever you think you can intervene for something progressive, go for it. Okay, so it's, I don't know if that's what you wanted to hear, but that is really what I increasingly think. And finally, the primacy of the economy over social. Yeah, you know, to me, this is a non-question, okay? I think, I, I agree, we have the same debate in India, uh, and I think it's a non-question, and it's also a, a bad question because it diverts everybody's attention, and then you have the, the, the economics first lot fighting with the you know, society first lot, and social categories more important. But they're so intertwined. Yeah. You know, I mean, you cannot imagine labor markets in India without thinking of caste and gender and ethnic, etc. And I'm sure in South Africa, you cannot imagine labor markets without race and gender and, and etc. You can't imagine patterns of investment in India. I mean, you know, so much, the Hindu undivided family explains so much of what Indian big business does. And, and so on. So, you know, I could go on and on. If they're so intertwined that anybody who looks at only one side is being a fool, frankly. Yeah. There are too many fools around in our subjects. That unfortunately <laughs> too, especially in economics, I think we take most of the blame for that. But, you know, to say, <laughs> but to say which one is more important, you know, they're both, you know, it's so enmeshed. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Um, can I uh, use exercise my powers and share to ask a question? Okay. I want to actually ask my wife a question. Um, since you are tips and you're thinking about a gendered industrial policy, um, how has it? What has been the experience? Your experience in terms of convincing DTI and various other um, uh, eight, uh, departments to think in this way? Um, or where exactly is your work now? And like, how, how, yeah. Um, okay, question over there. Any questions? Uh, so my question is, to what extent can these be remedied by really pushing for more competitive and open left-wing democratic parties and candidates? Because sometimes we have democracies, but we don't have the right parties or candidates to actually push through these progressive issues. I wanted to ask a question to Jayati, and in, in an example of looking for an alternative, for which, for Cuba as an example, and I don't know how much, if you could say a bit about that, because of the, a few things. So we have this problem where we have backward states and governments, and as citizens, we're trying to pull them into more progressive ways of doing things. My limited understanding of the issues of sexism in Cuba, for example, is that the government there drives a very progressive agenda. And an example I had was around uh, parental leave, you know, when a child is born in a home. And they had the opposite problem. So they give this parental leave for six months, and they find that the women are still not going back to work. So they increase it to two years. And still, the women are still taking the leave. So then they open it up and say any member of the family can take that parent. And still the women are not entering the labor market fast enough. So you have this situation where the state, the government is pushing and pushing and pushing, and the take up is not happening. So then the strategies are around, okay, so we need to now change the mindset of the population so that they start to take more, take up these options. So that's an example. <coughs> Another thing is that, you know, their people have lived now for 60, 70 years. They don't know what paying taxes, because you don't pay tax in Cuba as a citizen. So in rethinking economics, and in rethinking, and I'm, I'm, I was struck by the level at which we're still using the conventional ideas mm. to shape a new reality. And for me, Cuba came to my mind that if we wanted to be more open in thinking of examples. These are the two things. And perhaps you will know other things about that place which could help us come up with alternatives. Okay, so uh, I think I mentioned earlier that I was actually presenting on behalf of a colleague. I'm not part of the project, so I'm going to hand this over to Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, so I think, just so you'll know, the project is actually for the DTI, and we're just starting. Those are some of our sort of initial data analysis. And the one thing I would say is, and I would be interested in what Jayati thinks about this, which is I think the paradigm of industrial policy has been very much geared towards heavy industry and heavy manufacturing and tended to ignore uh, women's work in the traditional sense of every kind, but particularly by shutting out services, which we're very strong on here in South Africa, that you end up shutting out, just ignoring most women's work in the industrial policy. So health and education and retail and all of those things where women work are ignored. And also domestic labor, which for low-income women and unskilled women is particularly important. No? So I would argue that one of the things you want to look at is what would an industrial policy look like if you said the aim is also to promote women's work? And just to be clear, there's always the argument that why don't we just get more women into heavy industry? 
but it's very difficult, firstly, those things, in, in any case, are not creating a lot of jobs, which is a further problem. Um, but also, I think that, and then I will shut up after this, that the issue that the slides raised at the end, which is this issue of, has come up, I think we need to be more clear about, which is a lot of the things that affect what goes on in the workplace and where women are in the economy is shaped by the family and education and churches and things like that. And so if you don't address those things, simply saying we'll try and get more women into mining or the refineries or whatever, rarely will work. And besides, by the way, a lot of those heavy industrial jobs are lousy jobs. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think she, she said it already in a way she answered some of that, that earlier question about um, industrial policy paradigm. But I, I want to just emphasize, I think I completely agree with what, what she said, and I want to just reiterate. I have the same fight in India as well, where industrial policy is really, first of all, seen as promoting large capitalist uh, activities, and secondly, promoting industry rather than economic activities. And uh, that's that's a very, very major flaw. So small, medium, and micro enterprises are completely left out of it in all sectors, including in agriculture. And that's one of the things when you're talking about Cuba where we could really, I mean, you know, their innovation in agriculture over the 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union was just amazing, right? That the shift to organic, the experimentation and the scientific approach to organic agriculture, making it in incredibly viable, I mean, they're astounding successes. Um, yeah, paid taxes is another very interesting you know, thing about how we would rethink the entire economic system and, and definitely in there. Um, but uh, many, many areas are very interesting innovation, a lot of which they did under duress, you know, because they were forced to because the external situation was so horrible. Having said that, I think another point you made is absolutely, you know, that so much shapes patriarchy. It isn't just economic policy or economic institutions that shape patriarchy. So just like Kerala, you know, which remains very patriarchal, and actually, you know, some of the comments made even by elected leaders and so on are horrifying, you know, and that they get away with it. But similarly, Cuba is, I mean, I was struck when I visited more than a decade ago at the degree of patriarchy. It's incredible, I mean, you know, that the, the attitudes to women's bodies, the, I mean, the whole thing was really quite, uh, striking to me that otherwise in terms of all these other indicators as you say and the state being very proactive in terms of trying to encourage not just you know more participation but um, better conditions for women uh, more gender sensitive conditions for women at work and despite that you have a culture that remains extremely patriarchal you know so yeah it's, it is very it's complicated it's not easy i know the question you asked then I mean, oh god Ah, yes. Of course we need more open and democratic political parties. You bet we do. What do we do if they're not happening? <laughs> and again, this is my problem. I'm just getting too old to sit around waiting. I face this problem every day. I face this problem every election in India, okay? I go, I call my house and vote. Yeah, and most of the time I'm voting against somebody. Rather than, you know, vote for somebody. Uh, so it's, it's really, really complicated. And, you know, we are always, I mean, among like-minded people, because so many of us say, yes, you know, we have to build a new party, etc. I have been part of so many such projects that have, you can't even say they failed because they were ready to come off. <laughs> 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 you know, so, you know, meander along, people turn up, meet around eventually. So, I, I wish I could tell you, Dali, I don't know. You know, I don't know what we can do in this circumstance. Because it turns out that even when you build, well, not always, and I hope that's not true, but even when parties are built with the best possible motivations and the best people and blah, blah, after a while, they, you know, the pigs turn into men. That whole Orwellian thing happens, that they, uh, they become very similar to, to other parties, or they become ego trips of the, the main guy, or, you know, something. So, uh, yeah. It's a really tough one. We were very hopeful in India there was a thing called the Aam Admi Party, roughly translated as the 
the average man's party, of course, man, right? Nonetheless, we went along with it. Uh, and it was supposedly, you know, a new alternative, grassroots, democratic, non-corrupt, etc., etc. And a lot of people, friends of mine, and many people joined it. A lot of us were very enthusiastic. They won the sound in the city of Delhi. And now they've done some good things, but it's become a bit of an individual project of a megalomaniac leader. No, so it's a tough one. I really wish I could give you better news. I'm sure that all of these guys can. Yeah? <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, that really